Coming in at number 10, we have the Mornak Ship Graveyard in Uzbekistan. This ship graveyard showcases the destructive power that man can have on his environment. This area used to be lush with life, and it was home to the Ariel Sea. This was a massive salt lake that housed one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world. It was teeming with life not just below the surface, but above it as well. There were thousands of people that called the borders of this sea home. It was where people would fish and live. An entire industry was built around this lake, but when the government government wanted to use the waters to expand the agriculture influence in the area, they started to funnel water out of the lake through the man-made rivers, and slowly but surely, they shrank down the sea and the salt levels skyrocketed. It was eventually too salty for anything to live in the lake. Eventually everything died off and everyone who used to live around there had to find other means of survival. Now the whole area is a desert that houses the rusted remains of ships that once traveled the aerial sea. Coming in at number 9, we have Miss World Discoverer Solomon Island. This is the worst nightmare for every single retired person who loves to spend their time going on cruises. In the 70s, the Miss World Discoverer was working as a cruise ship and while swooping by the Solomon Island, the captain made a huge mistake. He came too close to the island shore and hit a massive rock which pierced through the hull of the ship. So what happened to the 2,000 people that were on board the ship? Well, they were all eaten by sharks and now the place is called the Shark Graveyard. I'm just kidding, that didn't actually happen at all. Actually, not a single person died. Everyone on board managed to make it to the lifeboats, they made it to the shore of the island, and then the island had an operating ferry for tourists to visit. This was all very convenient, so it took a few trips but they were all able to make it home safely. Coming in at number 8, we have the Mediterranean Sky in Greece. Let's go over to a massive cruise liner that was built all the way back in the 50s. I'm not sure how long a boat is good for, but it would weird me out knowing that you're setting sail on something that is older than my parents. I think when I'm putting my faith in something that's supposed to take me across the ocean, I want to make sure that the blueprints have the latest updates. But even though this ship had a long career, it never saw any problems. The reason that it became a wreck was actually due to lack of use. It was sitting in a Greek harbor for over two years and then one day the ship started to take on water. I don't know if you guys know this about boats but that is very bad. Well, the owners of the boat didn't have the means to fix it, but they also didn't want to lose it to the murky depths of Davy Jones' locker. So they managed to get the boat to some shallow waters and they got it stuck on land. It stayed there for a time until the boat broke open and then it was laid there as a wreck. It's now a tourist attraction. I'm kind of realizing that going to see a giant shipwreck is like going to check out a big piece of garbage, but I still want to go for some reason. Coming in at number 7, we have the Bessie White from Fire Island, New York. That sounds like the most brutal place to be shipwrecked. Fire Island? It sounds like there would be an active volcano there and a bunch of locals there that want to tie you up and take you to the mouth of the volcano so they can sacrifice you. But it turns out it's actually a pretty peaceful place. The Bessie White was an old schooner that was mainly used to haul coal throughout America. It's a tough job, but someone's got to do it. The ship crashed off the coast of the island in the 20s and a pretty penny worth of coal was lost to the world and I bet a bunch of people were fired that day. You don't make a six-figure mistake and then just walk into work the next day like nothing happened. For a long time, the boat was gone to the world, but the changing shorelines revealed where it was left. You can go visit the boat whenever you want, but you just have to make it to Fire Island, so that might be a pass for me. Next on the list, we have the SS Maheo on Fraser Island, Australia. This ship was originally a navy ship, but it came in contact with a very intense cyclone, and now it sits on the shore of Fraser Island. The metal skeleton sits on the beach and looks just as dangerous as it is. Some people think that it would be a good idea to climb climb and enter the wreckage, and many of them learn quickly that there's nothing in there but pain. Many people have hurt themselves in the wreckage of the ship trying to get too close for photo ops or the perfect selfie. And it doesn't help that Fraser Island is already known for being dangerous from the aggressive wildlife that lives on the island. So if you go there for a visit, try not to draw blood while you explore. You don't want a pack of dingoes to be the last thing you see. Next on the list is the USTA Liberty in Bali, Indonesia. Now we're finally getting to a battleship. The USTA was smashed in the hull by a Japanese torpedo in 1942 just off the coast of Bali. It was extremely close to the shore, only 30 meters away, so most of the men on board were able to abandon ship and swim to the shore. And even though the ship has a dark past, it is now a prime time location for snorkeling and free diving. The wreck is only 9 meters underwater, so you can swim right out to it and dive down to find a wide array of sea life living on it. That's not a bad way to spend 
spend your afternoon, just have to forget that it's down there because of World War II. Coming in at number 4, we have the AA Airfield. At first glance, this ship looks like it was set up for an apocalypse movie, but you will quickly learn that it's actually just one of the most beautiful wrecks ever. It's just off the coast of Australia, and even though the ship is a giant hunk of dead metal, life has chosen it as a spot to create. There are trees growing out through the hull of this dead ship. They reach out through the top of the wreckage. Something that used to be a giant hunk of garbage has now become a marine and vegetation sanctuary. Coming in next on the list, we have the SS Thistlegrome in the Red Sea, Egypt. One of the most famous wrecks in the world, the SS Thistlegrome was doing its duty in World War II when it was shot down and sunk to the bottom of the ocean. But being a casualty of war was not what makes this ship so interesting. It's everything that was on board. Taking a dive down to this wreck is like stepping into a time machine. Old rifles, motorcycles, and army supplies are all stuffed away inside this wreckage. Some people say that salvaging some of the goods could be worth thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, but the wreck is now a protected reef, so there's no way you can bring that stuff back to the surface without breaking the law. It's all looking and no touching. We have the MV Panagotis in Zakynthos Island, Greece. I can't believe it took us this long, but we finally made it to a pirate shipwreck. It's not an old school pirate shipwreck that has black sails and a bunch of scurvy ridden hooligans who are constantly drunk on rum. No, this pirate ship was operating back in the 80s. It would come to a place known as Smuggler's Cove. This is considered the most beautiful beach in all of Greece. The waters are crystal clear, and the only way you can get there is by boat unless you can swim like Aquaman. This is why it was such a hot spot for smugglers to bring goods in and out of Greece. Well, one day, the captain of the Panagotis was feeling a little bit bold and he brought the ship in way too close and it hit land. The crew did what they could to try and get the boat loose but there was nothing they could do. It now sits on the shore of the beach as an added tourist attraction. And number one on the list is the SS Yonglanga, Queensland, Australia. Alright, grab your scuba gear because you're gonna need to head underwater for this next wreck. If you want to visit this one, you're gonna need your PADI certification because there is no way you're going to get face to face with this wreck unless you've got a scuba tank or some serious free diving lungs. When the Yolonga went down, it was not a pretty sight. It was actually a tragedy and a very scary one at that. A cyclone came through when the boat was out at sea, and even though they had a skilled crew, nothing could handle the massive swells that were thrown at them. The ship was ripped down underwater and 122 people died in the wreck. On the bright side, the wreck is now teeming with life. In the 109 years that the ship has been sitting at the bottom of the ocean, it has collected a ton of coral and marine life that call it home. This place is a scuba paradise. You can see everything from octopuses, manta rays, sea turtles, to tiger sharks. Not to mention the whole wreck is covered head to toe in coral. Some say it is the most beautiful sunken ship in the world. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the SS Sultana. Starting off heavy with this list today, we have one of the worst maritime disasters in US history, and it occurred on April 27, 1865. The SS Sultana was a side wheel steamship, and on that fateful day, it exploded on the Mississippi River just north of Memphis, Tennessee. This incident took place in a time after the Civil War had just ended, and of course, the POWs held in Confederate military prisons were eager to get back to their homes after everything they had just endured. This led to the federal government paying a hefty price to steam operators for each soldier they took with them. This then led to a whole bunch of steam operators cutting corners so that they could bank on this deal. In the case of the Sultana, this meant safety things like repairing a leaky boiler or adhering to the capacity limits were cut. At the time of the explosion, the ship was carrying as many as 2,300 people, which was over six times the limited capacity. Unfortunately, the neglect of the boiler led to it rupturing, which initially took the lives of hundreds of those on board. After this, the already overloaded docks were made weaker and they ended up collapsing, which left people trapped. In the end, around 1,800 people lost their lives. While I'm sure there are many Americans and others from around the world who have heard of this tragic incident by now, at the time, not many people knew about it at all. If you remembered, this happened on April 27, 1865, and President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated on April 14, 1865, which ended up overshadowing this tragic 
event in terms of coverage. And it's not like there was a 24 hour news cycle back then where they were just constantly being bombarded with the worst of the worst. Even today where we do have that, terrible things get overlooked and overshadowed all of the time. In our number nine spot today, we have the MV Donna Paz. This maritime disaster took place on December 20th, 1987, when this passenger ferry collided with the oil tanker, the MT Vector. The collision took place in the Tablas Strait, which is about 180 kilometers south of Manila. This ship was carrying more than 4,000 people, which was double its capacity, and at the time of the collision, there were no senior officers on the bridge of the ship, and on the Vector, there was no lookout, and it is thought that both ships lacked a functioning radio. That's what I like to call all bad. The weather and the waters were both quite calm when the collision happened, and despite the clear visibility, neither ship gave an indication that it noticed the other. When the collision occurred, the 8,800 barrels of oil and gasoline on the Vector quickly ignited and engulfed both ships in flames. Out of the over 4,400 people that were on board both ships, only 26 people were rescued from the waters and survived. It really makes you wonder exactly what happened here because from an outside perspective, it seems like this tragedy could have been avoided. In our number 8 spot today, we have the MV Wilhelm Gustloff. This ship was a part of the Nazi Strength Through Joy program, which was an important propaganda tool during the Third Reich. This ocean liner is said to have carried German workers who were indulging in leisurely activities on cruises throughout the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean, but when World War II began, it ended up being converted into a hospital ship. Closer to the end of the war, this ship then switched gears again and was called on in order to evacuate German troops and civilians from East Prussia ahead of the advancing of the Soviet troops. At this time, the ship had shed its white paint with red crosses that symbolized it as non-combatant, and this, coupled with the clear presence of troops on board, as well as the anti-aircraft guns on board, well, it was obvious that this made it a viable military target. While it was built to accommodate around 1,900 people, on January 30th, 1945, as the ship left port, an estimated 10,000 people packed on board. Just after 9 o'clock p.m. that night, a Soviet submarine fired three torpedoes at the ship, which slammed into its side. Because of ice, many of the lifeboats were inoperable, and those who were on board that were best trained to deal with these kinds of emergencies and dire situations had either been killed in the blast or were trapped below the deck. Just over an hour later, the ship slipped underwater. Unlike a lot of the other wrecks on this list, rescue did begin just minutes after the SOS call was sent out, but still only 1,200 people were saved. With a death toll of somewhere around an estimated 9,000 people, this remains one of the deadliest shipwrecks in history. In our number 7 spot today, we have the HMS Victory. This is one of the oldest wrecks we have on this list today, and this one took place on October 5th, 1744. The HMS Victory was a 100-gun Royal Navy vessel, and on October 3rd, just a couple days before the wreck, the ship was in a fleet reaching the English Channel. A storm ended up scattering the fleet all apart from each other, and on October 4th, the ships with the Victory lost sight of her. What happened to the HMS Victory remained a mystery for over 260 years, and it wasn't until 2009 that the fate was found out. Just 50 miles off the coast of England near Plymouth, the US company Odyssey Marine Exploration ended up finding the wreckage, and when found, the ship's cannons were still in good condition, with even the royal crests visible underwater, despite the nearly three centuries it had been. This was also the first time that any trace of the 1,150 sailors that were on the ship were found, as sadly, no one in the entire crew survived the wreck. In our number six spot today, we have the SS Kiangya. On December 4th, 1948, this ship was carrying thousands of passengers who were fleeing Shanghai due to the advancing People's Liberation Army. On this day, the official number of passengers was said to be 2,150, which was already almost double its capacity rate, but it's said that several thousand more people crowded onto the ship before it left the docks. I mean, this makes a lot of sense. It's weighing the risk of packing onto this boat versus staying in the situation you're currently trying to flee. As the ship got to the mouth of the Huangpu River, it is believed that it may have struck some sort of World War II era mine or something like that because it just exploded. Rescuers were also unaware of the explosion for hours, which only made the situation worse. Somewhere around 700 passengers were rescued, but this meant that a number estimated to be from 2,750 to as many as 4,000 people lost their lives in this explosion and the subsequent sinking of the ship. In our number 5 spot today, we have the RMS Empress of Ireland. The Empress of Ireland was a Canadian ocean liner that was out to sea on May 29th, 1914, when tragedy struck. The ship was traveling down the St. Lawrence River through some thick fog, which is what led to her colliding with 
the Norwegian Collier, which is a bulky cargo ship that was designed in order to transport coal. The cargo ship didn't sink, but unfortunately the same couldn't be said for the Empress as she listed and fast. Water began pouring in through portholes, which led to those below deck meeting their fate rapidly. The official death toll of the crash is said to have been 1,012 people, and it still remains the worst disaster in Canadian maritime history. It makes me wonder how, as a Canadian especially, I've never heard of this accident before. The wreck of this ship still lies in a fairly shallow 130 feet of water, which has made it a pretty popular diving location for those wishing to retrieve relics. In our number four spot today, we have the SS General Slocum. This passenger steamboat was built in Brooklyn, New York, and on June 15th, 1904, it was carrying members of the St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church as they were on their way to a church picnic. They were traveling up the East River on the way to Long Island Sound when a fire started in the lamp room. Considering the fact that the lamp room was obviously filled with lamp oil, while a fire on board a ship is never good, this is one of the worst case scenarios. Actually, lamp oil, oil rags, and nearby paint locker in a cabin filled with gasoline are actually what created this worst case scenario. The safety equipment of this ship was not nearly up to standards as it was rarely even checked, and when the crew attempted to get the fire hose in order to put out the flames, they found a rotten fire hose that crumbled in their hands. The life jackets being given out to people began to fall apart, and they couldn't even access the lifeboats at all. I cannot even imagine the panic people were feeling at this point. Many of the passengers saw no other option and jumped into the water to try and swim, but like many Americans at the time, they didn't know how, and the heavy wool clothes they wore only worked to weigh them down. At the end of the day, it is said that around 1,021 people lost their lives in this absolutely tragic event. In our number three spot today, we have the MV La Julia. This was a ship that was owned by the Senegalese government, and despite the fact that it was designed to carry a maximum of 580 passengers, on September 26, 2002, the ship had at least 2,000 people on board. This is obviously a huge issue, and this, coupled with the fact that there was a large amount of people who were sleeping on the ship's deck, which is of course above the center of buoyancy, only made matters worse. The ship was en route to the Senegalese capital of Dakar, and as it sailed farther out to sea than it was licensed to sail, it ended up encountering a storm and really rough waters. The ship ended up capsizing, and out of the 2,000 people on board, only 64 people survived the entire ordeal. Not only was this because of the fact that the ship sank exceptionally quickly, but it's mostly because rescue was not sent out until several hours after. The wreck is thought to be one of the worst non-military disasters in all of maritime history. Despite the severity of the situation, no one has been charged or prosecuted for the disaster to this day. In our number two spot today, we have the MS Al Salam Boccaccio 98. This is a shipwreck that took place on the Red Sea on February 3rd, 2006. At the time of the wreck, the ship was en route from Dubai, UAE, on the way to Safaga in southern Egypt. When the ship left port, it was already listing due to poor weather, and things only got worse from here. A fire broke out in the engine room, and it continued to burn despite the crew's best efforts to get it put out. The crew used buckets and buckets of seawater, and at one point the fire was temporarily put out, but it reignited before long. At this point, the captain tried to turn around and return to the port, but the drainage pumps weren't working properly, which meant that the hull of the ship had now filled up with water. When they tried to turn, it just resulted in the balance being all thrown off and the ship capsized. Like I mentioned before, when they set out, the weather was already bad, which of course made the rescue efforts substantially more difficult because those people also had to try and sail through this bad weather and strong winds. This left dozens out floating in the Red Sea. Sadly, it is reported that somewhere around 1,018 people lost their lives in this wreck. In our number one spot today, we have the MV Goya. This ship was built in Norway in 1940 and was meant to be a freighter, but in a World War II world, this ship ended up being used as a passenger ship in order to evacuate citizens as a part of Operation Hannibal. This, of course, as anyone could reasonably imagine, meant that the ship was very often overcrowded as they were trying to rescue as many people as possible at a time. On April 16th, 1945, the ship was carrying over 7,000 passengers, which is five times the amount of people it could safely carry, when it was hit by a torpedo that was sent from a Soviet submarine just before midnight. The force of the explosion was so great that the ship only took minutes to sink, and since the timing of the incident had most passengers in their beds, 
you can imagine the outcome. Because of a lack of proper record keeping in with the absolute panic of trying to rescue people with the imminent threat of attack, it isn't quite clear exactly how many people lost their lives in this wreck, but it's thought that somewhere between 6,000 to 7,000 passed away, which is unbelievable. It is thought that there were around 180 survivors of the wreck, and due to the unbelievable tragedy, the location of it has now been officially declared a war grave by the Polish authorities. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Mont Blanc and Imo. Halifax is a port city that is located here in Canada in the province of Nova Scotia. Halifax was a super important place during the First World War as it acted as a hotspot for ships that were carrying supplies, troops, ammunition, you know, war stuff. On December 6th, 1917, a Norwegian ship called Imo left Halifax and it ended up colliding with a French ship called the Mont Blanc. This is already disastrous, but it was made significantly worse by the fact that the Mont Blanc held explosives. Because of the collision, the Mont Blanc was pushed towards the shore and ended up setting the harbour front ablaze. Just a few minutes later, the entire ship exploded with a blast so strong that windows 50 miles away were shattered. Unfortunately, there were many, many people at the waterfront when the explosion happened, which led to 1,800 people dying in this accident. 9,000 people were injured, and it is said that 1,600 homes were destroyed in the blast. The force of this blast really cannot be understated. It was so powerful that it caused a tidal wave and violent tremors, which were able to uproot trees from out of the ground. They damaged railroad tracks, and they destroyed numerous buildings whose debris was scattered for hundreds of yards. In the end, this is what made this explosion one of the most violent non-nuclear explosions in history, and what makes it likely the world's largest accidental man-made explosion. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Toya Maru. This ship was a Japanese train ferry that was out to sea in between the islands of Hokkaido and Honshu in 1954 when it was struck by Typhoon Marie. The captain tried to ride it out and attempted to anchor the ship in place, but the winds were so strong that it broke free. Seawater began pouring into the engine compartment, which then caused the steam engine to quit running and the ferry was then completely uncontrollable. The captain continued to try whatever he could to get the ship to safety and he even tried to beach the ship, but unfortunately the waves were just too powerful. After being tossed around in the waves and battered by the water, and after all the rain and strong winds, the ship ended up capsizing and sinking. In the end, 1,163 people lost their lives in this disaster, including 35 American soldiers who are members of the US Army's 1st Cavalry Division Artillery. The Toya Maru wasn't the only ship sunk in this storm, as Typhoon Marie also sank four other ferries as well. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Taiping Steamer. In 1949, the Taiping Steamer was out to sea and was seriously overloaded with 1,000 war refugees on board. This ship was sailing from Shanghai, China to Keelung, Taiwan when it collided with a cargo vessel called the Qianyuang. At the time of this accident, the Taiping was fleeing the Chinese Civil War, which is why it was so overcrowded, when it only should have been holding a maximum of 580 passengers. This kind of overcrowding did not help with the sinking of the ship and sadly only sped up the process. It is also said that the ship was steaming without lights, even though it was after curfew, which of course likely didn't help to avoid this very tragic situation. Sadly, there were 1,500 people who lost their lives in this collision. In our number 7 spot today, we have the SS Principe Umberto. This ship was built in 1909 as an Italian passenger ship, but in the times during the First World War, it ended up being converted into an armed merchant cruiser. On June 8, 1916, this ship was transporting troops on the Adriatic Sea. These troops were part of the 55th Infantry Regiment and were on their way back from Albania to Italy. Although this ship was accompanied by others, it still ended up being struck by an Austro-Hungarian U-5 submarine that had launched a torpedo attack. This ship ended up sinking just minutes later and it is said that this disaster took the lives of 1,926 men, making it the worst naval disaster of the First World War in terms of lives lost. In our number 6 spot today we have the Yamato. This ship was a Japanese battleship that served in the Second World War. She was the lead ship of her class of battleships and she was one of the two of the heaviest and most powerfully armed battleships ever constructed. On April 7th, 1945, the ship was about 300 kilometers south of the Japanese island of Kyushu when it was confronted by a US carrier-based aircraft. This aircraft bombed the ship which led to it capsizing. This then caused the ammunition on board to explode which tore the ship in two. After a total of 13 torpedo hits and 8 
hits, the ship completely sunk. The ship was accompanied by a light cruiser and four other destroyers, which were all sunk in this event as well. This sadly led to thousands of deaths as most of the crew lost their lives in this battle. In our number five spot today, we have the Joseph Stalin. The Joseph Stalin was, of course, a Soviet passenger ship that was converted to carry troops during the Second World War. The ship was very important to Soviet forces as it was used in 1941 in the evacuation of Tallinn and was later used to evacuate the Soviet naval base in Hango, Finland. Just after this evacuation, on December 3rd, 1941, the ship ended up entering the Gulf of Finland where it encountered three German mines. This led to the crew scrambling around to try and fix up the damage that the mines had caused. While they were distracted by this, Finnish forces ended up spotting the ship and saw an opportunity to strike. This led to the ammunition that was on board the Soviet ship to detonate, which ended up taking the lives of 3,849 out of the 5,589 who were on board. Those who didn't lose their lives in this incident ended up being captured and held as prisoners of war by the German forces. In our number four spot today, we have the SS Cap Arcona. This ship was a German luxury ocean liner that was launched in 1927. But by the time the mid 1940s rolled around, however, like many other ships on this list, this one was put to use to help in the country's war efforts. This time, this ship was converted into a prison ship. In April of 1945, with the advance of the British Army, prisoners being held at concentration camps were being loaded onto ships, and the Cap Arcona was one of them. On May 3rd, 1945, with more than 6,000 people on board, the ship was attacked by the British Air Force. The prisoners on board were being held below deck at the time, and the ship was not marked with any sort of red cross, so unfortunately, those in the British Air Force did not realize that the ship was filled with prisoners at the time. The ship capsized, but did not sink entirely, but still, this wreck caused somewhere around 5,000 deaths. In our number three spot today, we have the HMS Armenia. This was a Soviet passenger ship that was first launched in November of 1928, and she had a maximum capacity of 980 passengers. During the Second World War, this ship was put to use by transporting troops, and from October 9th, 1941, the ship was used to evacuate soldiers, workers, and materials from Odessa. In November of 1941, there was the invasion of German troops that led to an extreme rush to evacuate the hospitals in the city of Sevastopol, and the Armenia was repurposed again into a hospital ship. This led to about 4,000 wounded people and medical personnel from 11 different hospitals being loaded onto the ship to set sail towards Yalta. Once there, another 1,000 passengers were loaded onto the ship in a rush, none of which were officially recorded. On November 7th, the ship was attacked by a German Heinkel HE-111 and in just four minutes, the ship sadly sank, taking the lives of almost everyone on board. Just eight people survived the entire ordeal. In German records, there is no mention that the Armenia was a hospital ship, so it's unclear if they omitted that tale or if they mistakenly believed that it was a troop carrier. Either way, it is absolutely devastating. In our number two spot today, we have the Arctic. This ship made its maiden transatlantic voyage in 1850, and it was best known for its speed. This ship was able to cross the Atlantic in just nine days. On September 27, 1854, the ship was sailing from Liverpool to New York City when it collided with a French steamship called the Vesta. This occurred in the thick fog that was found just off of Cape Race, Newfoundland. At first, it appeared as though the Vesta had received more damage in the collision, but soon the captain of the Arctic realized that the ship was rapidly taking on seawater. He decided to abandon the Vesta and head for land in order to save his passengers, but once he left the other ship, the damaged Arctic continued to take on water, which then put out the furnace and caused engines to stop working. This is when the captain ordered that those who were the most vulnerable be placed into the lifeboats first, but instead a number of crew and male passengers dashed towards the lifeboats, leaving hundreds of people to go down with the ship. There were about 400 people on board the ship that day and only 87 of them survived. 22 of the survivors were passengers and the rest, crew. The captain went down with the ship, but he managed to stay alive by clinging to some wreckage until rescue came. The other ship, the Vesta, did not sink and ended up making it to St. John's, Newfoundland. The crew members who abandoned everyone else on the ship were criticized for their behavior, which violated the laws that forbid sailors to put their own safety before that of passengers in emergencies. Despite this, however, none of the men were prosecuted for their actions. In our number one spot today, we have the RMS Lancastria. This ship was a British ocean liner, but in April of 1940, 
1940, she was reconstructed to be a troop ship under the command of Captain Rudolf Sharp. He sent the ship off to help aid in the evacuation of British troops and citizens from France, and on June 14, 1940, the ship departed from Liverpool. On June 16th, the ship anchored near the town of Saint Nazaire, and the following day, somewhere between 4,000 and 9,000 refugees loaded on board. This included civilians, soldiers, and other military officials. While carrying all of these people, around 4 p.m. on June 17th, the German Junkers Ju-88 the ship, which caused it to capsize and sink in an extremely fast 20 minutes. This caused over 1,400 tons of fuel to leak into the water, some parts catching fire, and while there were 2,477 survivors, no one is quite sure how many people lost their lives. This is because it was obviously a hectic rescue mission that had people rushing aboard. No one is quite sure just how many people were on board before the attack happened. It is thought that somewhere from 4,000 to 6,500 people might have lost their lives during this, which is truly a terrifying number. <laughs>